good evening. I'm Rebecca Bailey, Associate Director of Presentations here at the Music Center, and I am thrilled to welcome you to this opening night of Complexions Contemporary Ballet and to welcome you to this dance talk. Leading this talk is a longtime Music Center friend, Elizabeth Kay. She is an award winning journalist and dance historian who has written books on subjects ranging from the Los Angeles Lakers to American Ballet Theater. Her ebook about the Titanic, Lifeboat Number no. 8, reached number one on the New York Times and Amazon bestseller charts. She's a frequent lecturer here for dance at the Music Center and at Segerstrom Center for the Arts, and has given talks at the Metropolitan Opera House, the Kennedy Center, and the Guggenheim Museum. She has taught dance history at UCLA, Cal State, North Carolina School of the Arts, and at the Colvin School. Most recently, she co-authored a body of work, Dancing to the Edge and Back, with famed ABT dancer David Hallberg. Please welcome Elizabeth Kenny. Thank you, Rebecca, and hello, everybody. Uh, there has been dance for as long as there have been people. And the reason for this is simple. Whether it be contemporary or classical or hip hop, whether performed on a city pavement or in a cave, dance has always had an unparalleled ability to reveal the inner workings and yearnings of the human heart. Dance is the universal language that speaks to us fervently and urgently without the need to utter a single word. Tonight, the company speaking to us is Complexion's Contemporary Ballet. It is a relatively new company, having been established in 1994. The two founders of this unique endeavor are Desmond Richardson and Dwight Roden. Both were dancers in the great Alvin Ailey Company, where dancing is distinguished by its heroic vitality, and where dancers are as strong as they are pliable, and brilliant in speed, and captivating in stillness. After emerging from that incredible training realm, Roden and Richardson have been Complexion's artistic directors for the past 24 years, during which time they have steered their company toward the equally high-minded and challenging goal of reinventing dance through an eclectic mix of styles and methods and cultures. The company they've assembled is black and white and brown, and it comes to complexions from disciplines as disparate as the august Australian ballet and the Cirque du Soleil in Las Vegas. What these dancers have in common is their ability to ignite the audience, to reveal the range and the grace and the potency of the human body, and to do what Alvin Ailey bade his own dancers to do, to keep it simple and keep it real. But while it is the dancers that we see, the works they perform spring from the mind of the choreographer and reflect his or her sense of movement of drama, of beauty. The two special works on this program were choreographed by Dwayne Roden, who understands the uncommon potential of dance to enchant, to provoke, to touch a chord. The first piece, Block 25, depicts relationships, the ones that nurture and the kinds that tear you apart. As the title indicates, the score is by Johann Sebastian Bach who composed in the first half of the 1700s, and whose musical style fits largely into the conventions of his day, the final stage of the Baroque period, which means that this is music that does not necessarily lend itself to dance. For example, in his lifetime, George Balanchine created 465 works, but only two of them to Bach. Those were uh, episodes and uh, concerto barocco. Bach's rich music requires a richness in the dance, and Roden's task is to physicalize Bach's music. Now, also, I'd like to add that when you're watching this dance or any dance, it is always useful to remember what Balanchine said about the relationship between dance and music. He said, Ballet is music made visible. And that is why many people talk of 
seeing the music and hearing the dance. Now, we are incredibly fortunate tonight that there is in this piece a solo for Desmond Richardson, who is, among many other things, a guest artist in residence at the Gloria Kelfman School of Dance at USC. But he is also, and without question, one of the greatest dancers of his time. Desmond is an artist who can and has performed everything. The fiercely physical works of the Bailey Company, the jazz-inflected dances in the Broadway musical Fosse, dancing alongside Michael Jackson, Prince, and Madonna, shining in the powerful balletic works of William Forsythe, and dancing with American Ballet Theater, where he became, in the 1990s, the company's first African-American principal dancer. Desmond was born in South Carolina, and as a kid, he was an aspiring gymnast who was always moving and doing street dance and hip hop. Then one evening, when he was 11, he saw a PBS documentary about Rudolph Nureyev and Margot Fontaine. And he was absolutely stunned and moved by Nureyev's feral grace, by his coiled snake power. And he thought, that's what I want to do. I want to learn how to do that. And of course he did, though also, of course, not at first. In fact, a few years later, when he auditioned for the New York School of the Performing Arts, the teachers observing him literally laughed. Uh, because at that point, he had never had a formal class in dance. He was chubby, and he decided that he would dance to a street music tape, but that what he would put to it are moves that he had seen Mikhail Baryshnikov do in another PBS special. <laughs> Um, so, still, for all of that, there was something very special about him, and he was taken into the school. And there his talent and his potential soon became apparent, and he received a merit scholarship from the Alvin Ailey Company. To Mr. Ailey's great amusement, Desmond auditioned for the company three times by the time he was 15. Um, now, he was finally invited to join the company at the still artistically precocious age of 18. Uh, but at that point, he knew enough to know what he didn't know, always useful. And he hesitated to join the company because he really was afraid that he was not at the level of these incredible outdated dancers. But he soon was heralded as the most stunning of all the stunning Asian dancers. And what you saw when watching him was the joy that he took in movement. There was no ego in his work. There was no pruning. Instead, what you sensed was that for him, the dance was more important than the dancer. Now, this is true, of course. The dance, the dance as such, all of dance, is more important than any individual dancer. But it's not an awareness that every young dancer has. And it was certainly an unusual awareness in so young a star. And that wisdom and that generosity of spirit were among the many things that set Desmond apart. And ultimately, he really did achieve his early wish to be like Rudolf Morea. For he truly is one of the few dancers whose work can be compared to Nureyev's dazzling brilliance. Like Nureyev, he has such dazzling force and life emanating from his body that he is one of the very rare dancers who can literally stand on stage with his back to the audience and you could have a whole company of other wonderful dancers moving around him and yet your eyes will be fixed on Desmond. That is that, that's a star. When you're still a star with your back to the audience, that really is a star. Um, I thought it might interest you to know, since you're going to see the power of Desmond this evening, that he once said of himself, and I quote, I am a big knitting and crochet person. I crochet very well. I find that really quite endearing, and it is a hobby that he picked up during his years at the Avery Company. 
In fact, a lot of dancers do learn to crochet and knit because they spend so much time sitting during rehearsals when other dancers are being rehearsed, and you're just sitting in the studio with nothing to do. So it's not uncommon to learn to knit and crochet, as Desi did from another Ailey dancer. And um, as the rehearsals went on, he learned to fill his spare time by making scarves and sweaters. I was working with American Ballet Theater when Desmond <coughs> came there in 1997. And that was the year that American Ballet Theater brought their Othello, the ballet of Shakespeare's Othello, into the repertory. Uh, Desmond uh, was brought there to dance the physically and emotionally taxing leading role. And his Othello was absolutely overpowering. He took you on the most devastating journey, and I still remember the faces of the other male dancers as they watched him in rehearsal and in performance, all of them absolutely stunned and moved by his remarkable, <coughs> unearthly artistry. So now, 21 years later, we are very fortunate that when the curtain rises tonight, Desmond Richardson will be where he belongs on the stage. Now, Desmond's creative path has veered from that of his co-artistic director, Dwight Rowe, who, after retiring from dancing with the Ailey Company, became fascinated with choreography. Since then, he's created works for Ailey, for Dance Theatre of Harlem, for New York City Ballet, and many other major companies. <coughs> His works are characterized by their musicality, by their muscularity, and their way of incorporating ballet, modern dance, contemporary hip hop, and even other types of movement. Rodin's second piece tonight, Stardust, brings to mind the old maxim that an artist should make works founded in what he or she is passionate about because Dwight Roden is truly passionate about David Bowie. Roden came of age in the 1970s, adoring Bowie's songs and fascinated by Bowie's many personas, his genre-bending theatricality, his diverse imagery, his constantly evolving music, which is, as Roden puts it, these are the adjectives he uses to describe it, wacky, wild, wonderful, bizarre, beautiful, poignant. He adds, it was the sound of the time that I grew up in. Through my teenage years and high school, it was David Bowie everywhere for me. At first, he simply listened to Bowie's music, but then he saw him. And the combination of the visual and the vocal sent him deep into that amazed state. The British have a great word for it. The word is gobsmacked. As he explained recently, I was just done. I was so inspired. So while Desmond Richardson wanted to be like Muriel, Dwight Rowan watched David Bowie and thought, I want to be like that. As you know, Stardust is a tribute to David Bowie, but Rowan points out that it's actually much more than that. As he says, and I quote, it's a love note to him, really, that says, thank you for the color, thank you for the energy, thank you for the passion, thank you for the stories. Bowie was born David Robert Jones on January 8th, 1947. As a boy, his voice was considered adequate by the school choir. Though when he was nine, teachers described his movement during their dance classes as vividly artistic. They said his poise was, and I quote, astonishing in a child. He was 10 years old when his father brought home a bunch of records uh, by American rock and rollers, including Fats Domino, Elvis Presley, and Little Richard. I have to say these are names that we don't usually utter from up here, so it's really <laughs> kind of interesting. Um, and after listening to Little Richard's Chili Fruity, Bowie later said that he had heard God. The impact of Elvis was equally emphatic, and 
Bowen said he found his calling the day one of his cousins, he saw one of his cousins dancing the hound dog. And he said, I had never seen her be moved so much by anything. It really impressed me, the power of music. Bowie's career would spend five decades, and he would become a star in the early 1970s, when he developed a concept that eventually found form in the Ziggy Stardust character. His goal in creating Ziggy, he said, was to embody the ultimate pop idol who would look, as he put it, love this, like he's landed from Mars. <laughs> Certainly achieved that, I have to say. He was obsessed with the idea, and his girlfriend at the time recalled him scrawling notes on cocktail napkins about a crazy rock star that was either going to be named Iggy or Ziggy. And the character he finally conceived was actually a melding of two radical American musical figures, Iggy Pop, the king of proto-rock garage band music, and the fierce leather-jacketed Lou Reed, whose biggest hit walk on the wild side touched on transgender issues, drugs, male prostitution, and quite a few other things that I cannot mention here at the Music Center. <laughs> Um, and actually, Walk on the Wild Side was produced by Bowie uh, in 1972, which is the same year that Bowie unleashed Ziggy Stardust on the world. Um, as I'm sure you all remember, Ziggy had long, dark red headed hair, red lipstick, garish striped jumpsuits that were kind of part Elvis and part Star Wars. And Bowie at first took refuge in this character. He said of him and of himself, off stage I'm a robot, on stage I achieve emotion. It's probably why I prefer dressing up as Ziggy to Good David. Interesting, huh? Yet as he acted this role over an extended period, it became impossible for him to separate Ziggy Stardust from his own character on stage. Ziggy Bowie said, this is a quote, wouldn't leave me alone for years. My whole personality was affected. It became very dangerous. I really did have doubts about my sanity. But of course, he kept changing and evolving. And in fact, I would say that if he had an anthem, it would be his song changes which is, by the way, one of the songs you will see and hear in the love note tonight. Bowie was, at heart, I believe, a serious man who inspired the love and the respect of those who knew him. Though he was the leading exemplar of glam rock with his outrageous costumes and makeup and hairstyles and platform shoes and glitter, like many British rockers of his era, he worshipped American rhythm and blues music and the black musicians who made it. Um, interestingly, in a 1983 interview with the newly established MTV, Bowie famously called them out, and this is what he said to this guy who's interviewing him on the air. I'm just floored by the fact that there's so few black artists featured on MTV. Why is that? Uh, many black artists actually felt that he had married into their community uh, via his gorgeous wife, Iman, who is the, of course, the beautiful, beautiful Somali-born supermodel uh, to whom he was married for the last 23 years of his life. Stardust begins with the song Lazarus, the last single that Bowie released before his death. And it goes backward through the Bowie catalog, incorporating songs like Changes, Space Oddity, Heroes, which is sung by Peter Gabriel, Modern Love, and then concluding with Young Melodies. Heroes is part of what is known as Bowie's Berlin Trilogy, um, which was named for the three albums that he made after moving to Berlin in 1976. The albums were Low, Heroes, and Lodger. And these albums used electronics and experimental methods, and yet songs like Heroes conveyed an age-old theme, romance against the bleakest odds. The lyric includes these lines, though nothing, nothing will keep us together, we can beat them forever and ever, 
or we can be heroes for just one day. And when Laurie appeared at the concert for New York after the September 11th attacks, it was heroes that he sung. The song Young Americans, which Bowie said was about the predicament of two newlyweds, took two days to record. It's the title song of his ninth studio album, which marked a departure from his glam rock style and showcased his interest in soul and R&B music. Bowie would call the album sound Plastic Soul, and I'd like to read you his absolutely incredible um, description of it. This is what he said of his music. He said it is this quote, the squashed remains of ethnic music as it survives in the age of Muzak rock, written and sung by a white mime. <laughs> the ballet Stardust is in the tradition of serious works by choreographers who've created ballets to popular music. Ballantyne did it first with Who Cares, two Gershwin songs. Uh, the former Beatle, George Harrison's work, were put into a ballet, an American Ballet Theater, that was called Within You, Without You. And of course, the Joffrey Ballet's much heralded billboards was created to the music of Prince. In creating Stardust, Dwight Roden struggled to choose just a handful of Bowie's songs which was a very difficult task for him, given that he was a massive love with them all. Uh, he searched the Bowie archives, he studied images and videos, and he shared playlists and lyrics with his dancers, all of whom are old enough to have heard of Bowie, but perhaps young enough to not be entirely familiar <laughs> with his music. Once he had decided on the songs, the challenge was to create movement that would convey Bowie's essence. No small task. And so he had to develop a dance vocabulary for this work, a vocabulary that would literally, yet marvelously, bring forth um, a musical artist, an artist who used his eyes like laser beams, who emanated sexual authority, and wrote songs that took the listener into a journey through his mind and his heart. The dancers in Stardust have, as you will see, an undulating, pantomime quality. Their expressive, sweeping arms are finished in delicate hand gestures. You'll see the sensuality that comes from the way the beat of the music manifests in the hips but it really is the eloquence of the hands and the arms that give us a sense of what Dwight Roden calls, and I quote, the heart that you would feel inside of his work, the vulnerability, the softness, the humor. And so he seeks to present those tender human qualities while also keeping front and center the fact that Bowie's music, as he puts it, got into your body and made you just jam. <laughs> and to convey that combustible blend that Bowie was, the male dancers are strong but vulnerable, the female dancers are vulnerable but strong. And as they move to the music, you can kind of picture Bowie at the microphone in any of his countless guises, head thrown back, enticed by his own music, left leg keeping time, hips articulating the rhythm as he sings. Now, on a personal note, I would like to say that one of the things that touches me most about David Bowie is that he, which is, he did something not all rock stars do, and that is he truly returned the love and respect that his fans showed him. For example, his fans often sent him drawings and paintings that they made of him. And it turns out that he saved them all. So many that recently there was a show of these paintings, an exhibit of these paintings of Bowie done by his fans at the Brooklyn Museum. One man who sent him a painting many years ago wrote this on Facebook. Wow, I did this painting when I was in my early 20s. I sent it to David Bowie because honestly, he saved my life, but I never knew if he received it. I am so glad he did. Another fan sent him a short story he'd written. 
Well, we sent back a note that wrote, you're really good, keep writing. The songs that Bowie wrote were, above all, about being an outsider, an alien, a misfit, a sexual adventurer, a faraway astronaut. His music was an ever-changing blend, rock, cabaret, jazz, and his plastic soul. But it was always suffused with genuine soul. His final album was released two days before his death on January 10, 2016. In it, the song Lazarus, the first song in Dwight Gordon's Stardust, begins this way. Look up here. I'm in heaven. I've got scars that can't be seen. I've got drama can't be stolen. Everybody knows me. And yes, it is true, everyone knows David Bowie. And his influence has been unique. He has permeated, uplifted, and altered more lives than any comparable figure. As a star, as an icon, and as the patron saint of those who feel they do not fit in, he has produced a vast body of work that if it did one single thing, it encouraged people to be themselves. And so tonight, Dwight Roden's love note to Bowie is also Roden's gift to us. And when the curtain rises a little while from now, I know you will enjoy the gift. Thank you all so much for being here. Is it going to be back again? It's on Facebook. It's on Facebook. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you.